Good evening and thank you. Today we will have a brief introduction to uh, Chandogya Upanishad, uh, which is uh, one of the most important Upanishads. Even among the ten important Upanishads uh, expounded by Adi Shankaracharya, Chandogya is one of the two most important Upanishads, that is Brihidaranyaga and Chandogya are the most important and also Chandogya is much more uh, voluminous, much more exhaustive treatment of Vedanta than other Upanishads except Brihidaranyaga. Just a few introduction, a few words of introduction. Uh, we all know that there are uh, altogether four Vedas Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda and Atharva Veda um, and of which uh, Chandogya Upanishad belongs to Sama Veda. So that is an important point to remember. The word Sama itself has a special meaning. Sama means a Vedic mantra turned into musical structure. It is called Sama. Saman is called. So very interesting. Of all the Vedas, Sama Veda is the most musical and it is believed that uh, that was the first uh, scientific human endeavor, effort to uh, have a classical music. So, uh, you know, there is a particular uh, structure, musical structure about the Saman. Anyway, this is a very interesting subject for those who are interested in music. You know, I am not a musician myself, but uh, there are just a few ancient Vedic texts which again are considered to be the first uh, and earliest texts on uh, classical music. It's called Naradiya Siksha is one. It gives a very wonderful definition of uh, Saman. Saptaswara trai sama mochanastu eka vimshati tana ekona panjashat ityeda swara mantalam. So what it means is when Rigveda mantra turned into uh, musical structure, salmon structure. So you can find Saptaswara, the seven fundamental notes, you know, musical structure. It's already mentioned here, Saptaswara. I, I, I don't know the musical details of this definition because I'm not a musician myself. But this much as a student of Samveda, I know little about the connection between Samaveda and the uh, very concept of uh, classical music. So when a Rigveda mantra is <coughs> turned into musical structure, it is called Saman, it is called. So that's why one of the definitions, Chandoga Shabdasi Samagayaka, means Chanda Samagayati di Chandoga. So those who uh, those who sing Vedi mantras, not recite but sing, they are called Chandogya. And Chandogya Upanishads uh, evolved among them. Before entering the text, I am going to discuss 
a very interesting uh, part of this text which involves a very very beautiful story and a parable so it will be very simple but just before entering that part of the description i would say a few important things about the hermeneutics the tradition of interpretation of vedic mantras so according to the ancient vedic rishis i mean according to one of the most important um, maybe the founders of vedic hermeneutics his name is kartyayana so he says veda mantras are to be interpreted according to uh, either literal meaning the context the syntax indications propriety time sense matrix it's a very interesting uh, definition a very there's a beautiful sanskrit verse which tells you and one thing that strikes you is what a beautiful sublime uh, concept of language and music and spirituality and their interconnection that you find here so arthat prakaranat lingat aujityad desha kalatah mandreshu arthavivekasya itareshu iti cha sthiti katyayana's definition you know what it means how veda mantras have to be interpreted or understood not just interpretation but when you read a veda mantra when you read this ancient vedic text how do we derive at a meaning you know you know the problem is veda mantras are written in a language which is uh, different from modern sanskrit when i say modern sanskrit it means the sanskrit grammatical structure phonetic structure uh, that was um, uh, well defined by panini around 6th or 7th century bc that is modern sanskrit so when you talk about modern sanskrit you are not talking about sanskrit that evolved during the last 200 300 years we are talking about a language a phonetic structure a literary structure that uh, was established and developed by a great grammarian called panini that is his name when 6th or 7th century bc that you remember that means almost uh, well uh, almost uh, 2600 years before uh, uh, rp was structured by daniel jones and others in england you know the rp is the modern standard supposed to be you may not accept it in america but according to uh, according to their european uh, pedigree linguistic pedigree you know english pronunciation the science of english pronunciation was structured and defined and well uh, determined by certain phonetic principles by daniel jones and others uh, during the 1920s and 30s that is roughly 100 years back but sanskrit phonetic structure grammatical structure were formed and the sanskrit that we use today today i have to give a talk in sanskrit i have to use a linguistic structure grammatical structure that was put in place in the 6th or 7th century bc that is the antiquity and continuity of sanskrit language now veda mantras are written in a language in a kind of sanskrit which was used by ancient vedic rishis 3000 years before panini was born that means roughly around um, 3000 3600 bc so that is the antiquity of veda mantras so how do you make sense of veda mantras so the ancient uh, linguist katyayana says artha that is literally meaning indication indicatory expressions context 
the person who speaks the concept of propriety or conventional usage patterns prevailing in society at that time then etymological meaning so and also differences and uh, different meanings uh, to be derived at depending upon the differences in conventional usage and patterns in different places different countries different communities so this is a beautiful sanskrit verse which tells you how veda mantras are to be understood because the same word did not mean the same thing in every context i before uh, before i i may i i'm not going to Uh, deep into the subject uh, but to just to one give an example one definition says veda mantras are to be understood on the basis of the of the context and the person who uses it so uh, it is called prakarana vividhya and pravaktu vividhya means who uses that mantra i mean the meaning of a word depends upon the person who uses it see you no know? and also the context that is say as some uh, we call what we call it, a, a, sum, a, a summary of katyayana's view now coming back to the subject in the chandogya upanishad you find a, a quite a good number of teachers and students sanat kumara narada and then pravahana jabal jabali ashwapati you know the king of panchala he was Pra- Pra- pravahana jabali and then uh, udalaka and you find great students like uh, uh, shwetagedu uh, uh, and satyayagna paurushi you find a large number of great rishis names sages names are mentioned in the chandokya upanishad a number of sages are mentioned we don't have time to go through the entire text so i shall uh, go through only some important parts of the text there are eight chapters in the chandogya upanishad of which the sixth chapter is the most celebrated one the sixth one and chapter 6 becomes so important because it contains what could be called the most pre- profound statement of the entire vedic literature it is a mahavakya called tattvam asi that is the mahavakya it means a great statement the word literally may not appear to be very profound lord of the meaning but again in the context by indications uh, i mean by the philosophical hermeneutical interpretation you find this particular statement tattvamasi becomes very profound a little boy his name is uh, shwetakedu the shwetakedu was a, was a boy in a vedic hermitage the hermitage was a place where Uh, the sages lived when they imparted vedic mantras taught vedas to their disciples to their children grandchildren and others so there was a there was a boy called shwetaketu so shwetaketu was not a very not very keen about his study so once it so happened that his father while returning home uh, found his son wasting his time instead of going to school wasting his time the uddalaka was the name of the father uddalaka himself was a teacher but teachers normally used to send their children to another sage for vedic education and afterwards the father who may be a scholar himself will 
teach him more. But at the initial stage, uh, they used to send their children to be taught by other sages in the neighboring hermitages. So once Uddalaga, while returning home, found that his son had completely neglected his studies. Then the father told him, Shweta Kedu, Shweta Kedu is the name of the son. You have brought bad name to our family. In our family, no one ever remained illiterate or uh, negligent to our studies. Swadhyayanma Pravadaha, that is one of the Vedic instructions to people. You should not, uh, you should not have a feeling, a sense of negligence or indifference to your studies. But this boy had not taken care of his education properly. So then um, he was put in a school. And after 12 years of Vedic education, the boy came back. And then uh, Uddhalaga, the father, asked him a question. Did you have, did you learn everything properly, Shweta Kedu? No, the father found the son had become very arrogant, very haughty. He thought, well, you know, if somebody and returns home to his parents living in a village, I suppose the father say, I, if father uh, asks the child, that child means he may be a young man at that time. Did you have a good education in Harvard or Stanford or something? And if the, if the student, the son, uh, uh, talks back in a haughty, arrogant language, you know, how the father, family people will feel about it? Something like that happened here. I, I shall read the first few verses, just as a better tradition. Om Sheta Ketu Karuneya Satam Kak Pita Uvacha Sheta Ketu Vasa Brahma Sharyam Navai Saumi Asmat Kuli Naka Ananu Chichi Brahma Vinduriva Bhavadidi Sahadwadasa Vasa Upetya Chadu Vimshadi Vasa Sarvan Veda Nathitya Makamana Anuchana Mani Sabda Eyaya Tam Kak Pita Uvacha I shall read out because it's rather fast. I shall explain in English. So, when the father found the son had become very haughty, so it says, Sarvan Vedan Aditya Mahamana, egoistic. The father found the son, instead of becoming humble and polite and refined, had become Mahamana. Mahamana means a person who thinks of himself too much. A very high opinion about one's own academic credentials after having educated. So he had become so haughty and proud. And then father asked him, Did you learn that by learning which everything becomes known? Did you learn the most important, the most vital lesson to be learned in life? Then Svetagedu said, No, I did not learn that. And Shweta Ketu in his heartiness says, Perhaps my teachers did not know about anything, about that. So what is that by learning which you come to know of everything? That is spiritual wisdom, spiritual truth. Or the wisdom that uh, takes you on a journey that will naturally take you to the highest spiritual enlightenment. Did you learn that? Let us say in modern, time, modern terms, suppose you have a very big degree and you are very proud of it. Suppose the parents or somebody asks, or maybe teachers, or seniors, or maybe friends may ask the person, did you learn that by which you will be able to handle, to make use of your learning? So we should learn and we should also learn how to make proper use of our learning. That is more important. Because if we do not learn the art of 
making proper use of our learning so that we will have the wisdom to avoid may abusing or misusing our learning then that learning we will land us in trouble so that's a lesson that comes from here so uddalaka the father is in, is indicating did you learn about spiritual wisdom about highest spiritual truth shwedagiri said he said no then uddalaka instruction so the sixth chapter has got uh, 16 sections from 8th section to 16th section it is each each called you know it is called khanda khanda means a section a part of the chapter from the 8th up to 16th section there is a description of the highest spiritual wisdom which is contained in the mahavakya the great statement tattum asi the literal meaning of the mahavakya is this what you are searching for tat the origin of the universe the absolute reality present everywhere in fact that is the subject of discussion in all upanishad discourses that is yourself that is within you it is not outside to put in simple everyday language what it means the god whom you are worshiping in temples and churches is really living within your own heart you should unfold and manifest the presence of that divinity which is already there within you so that is the real meaning of this mahavakya so in the eighth section the father uddalaga gives a general statement ek upadesha or instruction the instruction is saya esha anima aitadatya vidam sarvam tat satyam sa atma tattvamasi shweta ketu that subtle truth the self the essence of the whole existence that is you yourself that means you yourself are that spiritual truth that you are seeking outside of you it is you yourself so in the eighth section it khanda uddalaka the father makes the first instruction then shweta kedu could not understand it because nobody will be able to understand this so shweta kedu the the son requests uh, the father to repeat that instruction again and again so he repeats it eight times with eight illustrations so shweta ketu after listening to this great instruction what is the instruction the instruction is that absolute subtle spiritual truth aidadatna vidam sarvam tat satyam that truth that is the essence the self the atman of the whole existence that is you yourself that thou art that is you yourself that is what makes everything existent so shivaji ke do could not understand why he could not understand because when uddalaga the father addressed shweta ketu you o oh, shweta ketu hello shweta ketu let us say shweta ketu thought uddalaga is addressing the son 
stand in the, the physical body. But what Shweta, what Uddhalaga was it was thinking of, or had in mind was the Atman, the soul, the Atman that is the inner resident within Shweta Gedu, not the physical body, not the mind, not the body, not the senses, not the intellect. But behind and beyond all these, there is that guiding divine light present in all of us. That which is the inner resident within Shweta Gedus, that is the reality. Realize that truth. This was the implication. But Shweta Gedu did not understand this. Suppose in a classroom, you teach something to a student. He will understand only what is ready to understand, what is qualified to understand. Because understanding is nothing but connecting what you know with what you are learning new. Associating with what you already know. That's how we uh, become familiar with the new ideas. But Shweta Gedu was not ready for it. So he repeated, Bhūya eva ma bhagavān vijñāpayatu Father, please repeat this again. Father did not just repeat. The father repeated on each occasion the same statement with a new illustration, with a new... The, the, those illustrations are very profound. So there are eight parables, eight examples. It's called Drishtanda, with eight repetitions. Total, altogether, there are nine statements of Tattumasi. It is called nine statements. So Tattumasi is repeated in this text nine times. The first one is the general instruction, then eight repetitions with eight examples. So each time when Sri Gedu heard, listened to this, he told his father, Bhūya eva ma bhagavan vikya paidu. Father, please teach me again. And father replied, Tatha somya itikavacha means, Okay, son, I am going to teach you again. So that is why total nine statements. The first statement comes in the eighth khanda, then eight repetitions with eight illustrations and examples. This is the structure of this sixth chapter. Okay, now I am going to take uh, what may be perhaps the most interesting example, illustration given by Uddhalaka. It is called Gandhara Purusha Dhrishtantaka. Or Abhiradhaksha Dhrishtanta, what it means, the example, the parable about the blindfolded man, that is literal meaning. So the story is this. So it, it actually um, revolves around one interesting thing that happened. You know, we should remember we are talking about a time and age when there was direct land route between India's northwestern borders with Afghanistan and going beyond Afghanistan, Iran and eventually, of course, those of you who are historians may know that there used to be land route and close connection and association between India's northwestern border with Greece going all the way westward through today's Pakistan. Of course, Pakistan was at that time part of India, you know, India because many of the Vedic, uh, Vedic uh, stories, many of the Upanishad stories actually are set, uh, sitting in what is now Pakistan and Afghanistan, surprisingly. These regions formed the cradle and is part of the cradle of Vedic culture in ancient times. So there was land route all the way from Greece to northwestern borders of India. That's why 
according to modern historians, including Western and also Eastern historians, you find the influence of Indian philosophy, Sankhya, Yoga and other philosophical systems in the writings of Heraclitus, Pythagoras. Uh, many of the uh, Greek philosophers who were contemporary, who, were, who lived around the same time with Buddha, almost 6th century BC or 5th century BC in Greece. So there is to be close association, intellectual association between ancient Greece and India uh, going through this, uh, this land route. So the story revolves around a person who was traveling, uh, rather going back to what is now Afghanistan. It's called Gandharadesh, it's called Kandahar. Kandahar is the capital of, uh, uh, of today's Afghanistan. That's the name of the city. Now it, its old name in Sanskrit books are called Gandhar. So Gandhara Purusha Dhrishtantaha is the illustration that you, that you find in the 14th section Khanda of the 6th chapter of Chandogya Upanishad. The story about, the parable about uh, a person who was, uh, who, who, who was returning to his hometown that is Kandaha, Gandhara Desha. So as he was walking along a forest tree from India to his hometown in Afghanistan, Gandhara Desha, he was uh, robbed, ambushed and beaten and dragged into a thick forest by robbers. Some robbers came, ambushed him, took away all, all his possessions and uh, tied him free and went away. And after some time, another traveler who was returning from Gandharadesha, he heard this cries, the weeping, the wails of this poor man who was robbed and ambushed by the robbers. I am left here in this forest, please help me, save me. Shankaracharya, the commentator, puts very colorful language in the mouth of this poor man uh, who was crying and weeping, telling his tragic stories, what he all had to endure at the hands of the robbers. So the Shankaracharya's commentary is very, very graphic in these areas. So anyway, this man made a lot of noise. So a compassionate traveller who was moving along the same road came to his rescue, untied the ropes, removed the blindfold from his eyes, brought him back to the main road and told him, you, you move in this direction, you can get back to your home. To your home. Edam Drisam Praja. You walk in this direction, you will get back to your hometown. And he reached there and lived happily. This is the outer shell of the story. Now what is the essence of the story? The Shankaracharya steps in. The Shankaracharya says, in this story, the poor man who was ambushed on this forest tree corresponds to Jiva, all people living in this world. So, uh, this body is the forest. So you should remember, that is an important thing to remember. This body is, you know, the body means what? All that we have in, in, inside the body we may be very proud of our body, but if something from within the body comes out, then we have to use sanitizer. We have to wash our hands. So our body is a necessity. It's an instrument for a higher purpose. With this, if your body is healthy and strong, you'll be able to meditate. You'll be able to read wonderful books. You'll be able to do wonderful work. You can serve the country, you can serve the society, you can, you can help others. 
For all these, this body is needed. So the body is valuable only because it helps you to go beyond itself. If you are enslaved by your body consciousness, if you consider this body as the highest thing, as the most wonderful thing in the world, then it be like thinking, well, I am now staying in this forest, I am caught and ambushed and tied to a tree. This is a very wonderful place for me to stay. Suppose the poor man who was ambushed thought, well, nothing has happened to me. It is a very happy state of affairs. He will never come out of it. So he has to complain about his conditions. I am ambushed, robed, left in this forest, blindfolded, tied to a tree. Please come and save me. Please come and help me. So we need to develop a higher aspiration for higher life. For that we need to develop a kind of aversion towards our present conditions. That is the beginning of spiritual life. Even if you want to read a good, great book, even if you want to become a great, real, great classical musician, if you want to become an artist, if you leave it alone, if you want to become a saint or philosopher, that's a different thing. For all these, we must make some effort to get out of this prison of embodiment. It means you should think of yourself as something beyond this body. You can imagine Stephen Hawking, I mentioned this example. He could get beyond his body. That's why he could do great things. So, body is needed. Body should not become a prison. So, this man went on crying and weeping. So, a compassionate traveler came and brought him out of the thick forest, removed his blindfold, removed the ropes that were that used to for binding him, and brought him, uh, took him to the main road, asked him, you go take, you take this way. The compassionate traveler is a teacher, a spiritual teacher. So, a spiritual teacher should be familiar with the with the root, you know, with that location, then only he will be able to guide the poor man, the imprisoned man, to get out of that thick forest. So he should be able to guide. For that he should be familiar with the location. And then what happens here? The, the rope used to tie him to the tree, it is it corresponds to our desire for sensual pleasures. So remember, the forest is the body and this, our desire for worldly pleasures is the rope that binds us to this body. And then a piece of cloth is used to cover the eyes not mask, remember. In this context, a piece of cloth is used. The piece of cloth corresponds to delusion, wrong idea, wrong impression. This world is just meant for enjoyment. This world, the only purpose, the only purpose of this world is to present uh, objects for enjoyment. And who are the thieves? Our own wrongdoings, our own good actions. So our own actions produce thieves. Our desire is the cloth that blindfolds us. This forest is this body. And the poor man who is caught and imprisoned inside a thick forest corresponds to uh, the, uh, the traveler, I mean, he is the, he is the, all, all the jivas, all individual souls. This is the very interesting story. Now, what is the message of the story? 
I would like to read the text because it's a sacred text, so we should read it. Then I shall explain. Yatha Sobhya Purusham Gantari Bhya Aminadhaksham Aniya Tam Tato Adijani Visrujit Sayada Tatra Prangva Udangva Dharangva Pratyangva Pratmani Pratmayi the Abhinadhakshani the Abhinadhakso Visista. The story goes like this. He was taken to different directions in the forest. Finally, he was blindfolded, tied to a tree, left in a thick forest, and the thieves went away. Tasya Yitha Abhinakanam Pramuchya Prabhuya Edam Disham Ganthara Edam Disham Ganthara Prajayiti. Now, a good compassionate person who is traveling the same route, same forest trail, he listens to these wailing sounds. The great spiritual teachers, the world has produced a Buddha, a Shankara, Sri Ramakrishna, a Christ, or the spiritual epoch makers. They listen to the wailing sounds of humanity and they descend, they come down and they give their teachings, they make sacrifices and they give us proper directions. So that's why, you know, here, Sa Grama Gramam Pruchan Pandito Medhavi Gandhara Neva Upasam Paddyeda. So when we listen to the teachings of the great teachers, you should remember we should, we should have a sense of propriety and wisdom and discerning mind to listen to the great teachings of the spiritual seekers. We should listen, we should remember that we should be able to make use of what we listen and what we remember. So in the spiritual journey, there may be sometimes junctions where three, four streets meet. So you will be in confusion. Which way to move? We are not sure. And not only that, in the Shankarajaira's commentary which is very humorous and very graphic, he says, suppose you are given proper direction by a teacher, but still, you, don't, you are not steady enough. You, are, you don't have the sense of steadiness and stability. Then what happens? You could be distracted. So when you are traveling, suppose somebody, suppose you are, you are traveling in a forest and you are lost and somebody shows you the way. He brings you to the main road and tells you, well, you move in this direction. Then he may give some direction, some instructions. After this, you may find a road, you may find a home, you may find a house, you may find a building. Then you should take a left turn or right turn, you know, you know, like a Google Google Maps, so to speak. These instructions are there in the scriptures, in the teachings of great spiritual teachers, and we should be able to understand it properly, and we should be stable enough, steady enough, not to be distracted by temptations on the way. Suppose there is a garden, wonderful flowers, wonderful fruits, you forget the instruction of the, of the man who helped you. Then what happens? You may get caught again, you may fall in a precipice. So you should be able to follow the instruction properly, that's why you know, he goes from village to village. He is traveling, going back to his home. So on the way, he may find people. He should be able to help them. In spiritual life, we should be able to discuss spiritual matters with other spiritual seekers. And we and we should learn more from others. Others will get an opportunity to learn more from us. So if you are wrong, we may be corrected. If you are right, we get the confirmation. So that's why the Upanishad is very graphic. Grama Gramam Prichan. From village to village you move as you travel backward according to the instruction of the compassionate traveler who is in the story, uh, who corresponds to the spiritual teacher, the preceptor. So, 
he should be able to take the help of the signs you know like traffic signs gray green light or red light with this a red light we should have a strong determination not to move in that direction if there is a temptation in spiritual life is like red light so we must keep ourselves focused on the main road such a person you know what happens he will he will get back to his home town gandhara neva upasampadyeda such a person will reach his home town in slowly if he follows the instruction if he is steady if he is stable and if he has the wisdom and the proper sense of what is the right thing to do and what is the wrong thing to uh, to avoid doing is called you know uha apoha vichakshana so such a spiritual teacher is um, is mentioned in the viveka churamani by shankara acharya you know medhavi purusho vidwan uha apoha vichakshana ka adhikari atma vidyaaya mukta lakshana lakshita means such a person should have the intelligence to understand the wisdom to understand what is good for him and then he should have a sense of propriety a discerning mind to accept what is appropriate for him what is good for him and to reject and filter out what is inappropriate these two faculties are very important in spiritual life and then what happens when there is a wrong direction when there is a junction he will if somebody may give a wrong direction you go this way you should have you should have the ability to understand that is not the instruction to follow he should stick to the main instruction that you receive from the teacher who rescued him from the thick forest by removing the ropes uh, by, by, by removing the blindfold and untying the ropes brought and uh, bring to the main road and directing him to go straight to the home town so this is a very graphic description it means there are certain things that we uh, can learn only from scriptures so shankaracharya says shastra acharya upadesha samman uh, samskrta uh, samskrtam mana atma darshane karanam shastra acharya upadesha samskrtam mana shastra means scriptures acharya means a teacher who teaches the scripture so we should learn from the scriptures we should listen to the instructors the teachers and then we should think we should meditate and through meditation we should internalize what we learn when we internalize great spiritual teachings what happens you know our mind becomes refined that's the meaning shastra acharya upadesha samskritam manaha samskritam means purified refined so when the mind is refined purified through meditation through introspection through contemplation on what we learn from holy books and from the instructions of the teachers what happens such a mind becomes the right instrument for understanding and realizing the highest spiritual truth such a person who carefully remembers the original instructions he received from the teacher who rescued him from the forest that person alone can reach his home town he should be steady enough to remember his instructions and he should use his wisdom his common sense to avoid taking a wrong turn if he takes a wrong turn he'll be coming backward or he may fall over a precipice a, a wrong by lane or if you take a side road uh, deviating from the main road that means the instruction from the teachers you know he may not reach his destination so it is a very very beautiful a very profound uh, uh, metaphor 
that you find in this uh, in this sixth in the fourteenth section of the sixth chapter of the Chandogya Upanishad, such a person will eventually realize his spiritual truth. So his father went dawn instructing him. And finally, in the sixteenth sec section, Swedagedu could not still understand. Swedagedu was confused. His father is telling him, Oh, in this body, that Atman is there. I don't see any Atman anywhere. Then the father told him, Meditate. Think, meditate. And it eventually, uh, Swedagedu realized the supreme spiritual truth. He himself became a great teacher that you find in the Upanishad literature. So what this particular uh, intersection of the Upanishad tells us is, first of all, human life is like a journey on a forest trail. You may find fellow travelers, on a way you may find fellow travelers. But there is always the risk of our being carried away by our greed, by our attachment to sense pleasures. Once we are aware of this, what happens? Oh, this is what the scripture said. So I should be careful. So I should stick to the free, the main highway. That takes me to my own spiritual destination. That's a central important illustration. You know, you are most welcome to ask questions and uh, welcome for an um, active discussion. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar Swamiji. Namaste. Uh, I had a question. Yeah. So, you mentioned that Uddhava gives eight different illustrations of Tau art, uh, that, that art Tau. Yeah. Um, now these eight different illustrations, do they uh, reflect a different aspect of the same Mahavakya or, or do they all yeah. just uh, try to more strongly <laughs> emphasize it or do they illustrate a different aspect each of yeah, these? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So you know, uh, the Drishtanda illustration is called Madhupur Drishtanda, Nadi Drishtanda, Jeevan Briksha Drishtanda, Nyagrodhavala Drishtanda, Jerakshipta Levana Drishtanda, Badhakshasya Drishtanda, Mumuksha Purusha Drishtanda, Tapta Parasya Drishtanda. Anyway, I just, uh, I just gave you a list. What it means is, you know, see for example, uh, Jeevan Briksha Drishtanda. In each case, Swedakedu ask for further instruction. I can, to, uh, to give an illustration, I can uh, just uh, uh, give a sample. I, I will tell you. That's a very interesting thing. Anyway, I shall give a sample. Now, what happens, you know, when, when uh, uh, Svetagedu got this instruction, he asked one question. Now, you see, uh, the question is this. Uh, you, there is one instruction where it is said, you know, the father told Svetakidu, in deep sleep in Susupti, we will, uh, we will become, we will feel an identity with Atman. And then, uh, you, you can find in deep sleep, Susupti state, you will not experience any multiplicity of objects or anything. So is that a state of Advaita experience? There is similarity, but they are not the same experiences. But Svetagedu has a doubt about it. So in order to clear that doubt, Uddhalaga is giving Madhukrudhustanda. You know what Madhukrudhustanda is? It means these, you know, the honeybees, they collect uh, honey from different flowers. Uh, and once they 
P events they all together form a single honey structure. Uh, their individual identities. Some some honeys must have been brought from mango flowers, other kinds of flowers. You know, you find these uh, honey bees collect all kinds of honey things from different flowers, different uh, sources of honey, which may have individual identities. But when the honey is formed, when you go to honeycomb, the honey is one entity. It's all merged into one. Because they are merged into one, they do not recognize their individual identities. Similarly, when in deep sleep, we uh, experience this uh, unique feeling of identity with, uh, with the state of uh, non multiplicity we become total identity one all per, with one all pervading reality we experience that but we are not aware of it at that time when we become aware of it only when we actually do spiritual disciplines and reach that state which is called samadhi so the difference between samadhi and sushupti so sushupti or deep sleep is available is possible for everyone. That's why nobody should see Taika Vyagrova, Simkhova, Vrkova, Varahova, Kidova, Padagova, etc. What it means is, I mean, the animals, the lions and tigers, all the creatures and wild animals, they all experience deep sleep. But they come back again as wild animals. But if a person uh, practices Sadhana Zadustaya, spiritual discipline, uh, austerity, karma yoga, and then scriptural study and contemplation, meditation. Then when he experiences this transcendental state, then it will have a complete transforming effect on him. He becomes a different person. He cannot return to this previous state. If he will be an enlightened person, he becomes a Buddha, so to speak. So, in order to uh, clarify a doubt from uh, Svetagedu, who asked the question, if we experience this uh, oneness with the all-pervading reality in deep sleep, then how are we not aware of it? How we are not able to remember it? The answer is, we reach that stage, but we have not reached the stage through proper spiritual disciplines. Without proper disciplines, we instinctively ex experience that. It doesn't have any lasting effect on us. So in order to uh, make clear this difference, you know, one drishtanda is given called Madhukradrishtanda. Means the example of uh, honeybees. Like that, you know, there are many. In another context, Uddhālaga taught uh, Svetha Ketu. You know, in, in, our, in our body, this, this Atman is present all over. The whole human system, that Atman is present. Every is all-pervading. It is under the Ami, it is within. In order to give an example, you know, he gives, you know, Nyagro the Paladrishtanta. How we are not able to see it. So Uddhālaga tells, the sun, you bring in a Nyagrodha Phala, means a fruit of banyan tree. And ask him, Binti, you break it. And the sun breaks it. He goes on breaking the outer shell, then he breaks the inner shell. Finally, he breaks the inner kernel and inside, what do you find there? I don't see anything. You don't see anything, that's true. But out of that, the huge banyan tree comes into existence. So the point is, when Uddhālaga says something, like for example, from this subtle spiritual truth, Atman, the whole creation emerges. Svetagedu did not understand. How can, from, how can uh, this subtle spiritual truth, uh, how can it give birth to this visible universe of uh, multiplicity and manifoldness, trees, mountains and valleys, all these have emerged, all of us have emerged 
from the subtle Atman, that reality. How does it make any sense? So Uddhalaga tells you bring a banyan, you bring a fruit of banyan tree, break it, again break it, and inside, what do you find? I don't see anything. Before that he saw little seeds. And you are uh, asking you break the seed again. After breaking the seed, what do you find? I don't see anything. You said you don't see anything. That means there is that invisible subtle truth from which the huge banyan tree comes into existence. So from subtle truth, this gross universe can come into existence. So that point is established through another illustration. So remember, uh, it's not that Shwedagedu was so dull. The whole setting is meant for instruction. So you should remember, of course, there is a little bit of historical and sociological factor to be kept in mind. In ancient days, uh, during the early Vedic times, Vedic period, there were no temples. So the sages used to teach their students mostly taking illustrations from open nature. The trees and mountains and valleys and rivers. Now see, there is, there is another one, there, you know, Nadi uh, Drishtanda and then Jalakshipta Levana Drishtanda. Again, Shwetagedu had another funny doubt. He said, you know, we are not able to see it. We are not able to see that reality. Does it mean that it is not there? Then Uddhalaga asked him, you bring, uh, you, you bring a glass full of water. There is no glass, you know, some water. And asked him to bring salt. So now you put that salt in the water. And tomorrow morning what do you find? There is only water, no salt. The salt has merged with water. Then as you taste it, you cannot see salt, but now you can understand the result by tasting. So, if, through, if you cannot see or experience with one instrument of perception, there is another instrument of perception that you can use. And there are certain uh, situations where you cannot, you cannot learn from yourself. In that case, you have to learn from scriptures or teachers. For that, this, uh, you know, Gandhara Pushadrishtanda is given. So each illustration follows a request for, an ex for another explanation. And it has a background. So it moves uh, from 8th Khanda to 16th Khanda, the gradual ascent. Eventually, all possible doubts are gone. Still, Shwedagedu could not understand what does it mean you are that. Then Udhalaga told him, you go and meditate. And he meditated, he realized it. That's all. I think that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful explanation. Like especially, I, I really like the, yeah. the idea about the uh, Madhukara Drishtanda. Uh, yeah. You are talking about honey, honey. Madhukrat. Uh, Madhukrat. Yeah. yeah. And I look forward to the other Drishtandas also. To, to yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. But well, if you let, later on, we can, I can take each of these illustrations, see very, very graphic descriptions. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks, Swami. Thank you. Namaskar, Maharaj. Yes, Namaskar, Namaskar. Uh, this is Bobby. And I, uh, I marvel over the description of the sixth chapter. And this isn't the end of the Chandogya Upanishad. It goes on to, to a seventh and an eighth. Yeah. And yeah. My question is about the opening of the eighth, yeah. where the body is uh, uh, rehabilitated, so to speak, as the, uh, as the uh, uh, city of, of Brahman. Yeah, the yeah. palace yeah. Uh, in, of the indweller, yeah. uh, Brahman. Yeah. So this event creates this uh, 
yeah. uh, continuing expansion of majesty and transcendence in, in this particular Upanishad. It yeah. builds and builds and builds. Yeah, yeah. I, I want, yeah, you, very wonderful uh, observation. You know, Shankaracharya says, you know, very interesting, uh, when you look at the whole thing from the standpoint of a spiritual evolution, then after Tattumasi, after the Mahavakya, Upadesha, there is nothing more to be taught and there is nothing more to be done. So, Tadrasen Upakshayad, I already discussed this in my Bhashya class on Thursday, you know. But the point is, this Upanishad text doesn't follow a particular chronology. So you find, you find in Brahmani Upanishad, the Mahavakya is given in the first chapter itself. And then this whole book later follows. So that's an that's important thing to remember. These texts were memorized uh, and they were, followed, they were taught and memorized. So in terms of uh, contents, if there is no, uh, it's not a, it's not like you present a paper where there is a beginning, a summary, the beginning, middle portion, the conclusion, nothing like that. There is, it is so irregular because the Vedic mantras evolved uh, naturally and spontaneously. So in many of the, uh, of the Upanishadic texts, the Mahavakya, the main teaching sometimes comes uh, in the middle or maybe uh, uh, in the beginning itself it comes. Now the most important part of the Mandukya Upanishad comes fairly early actually, <laughs> remember. So there is no strict chronology, you know, it's not one, two, three like that, doesn't follow that. That's why it is more like, uh, more like uh, a structure of uh, human spiritual evolution, that is what you find here. It doesn't follow a strict chronological order. Anything which has got a mathematically precise order is artificial. There is no life in it. The Upanishads constitute a living uh, spiritual document. So that's why there is, it is a bit irregular in the structure. It is Shankaracharya who brought, brought in a sense of regularity uh, by building up a huge uh, philosophical edifice called Advaita Vedanta. It go, the credit goes to Shankaracharya. Yeah. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you. That makes it even better that yeah. it's not that it's not linear. That we just receive yeah. it as edited this way. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. I um, I wanted to uh, then follow up and ask about the the music which you started with and the idea that the um, Instructions from Gaga are repeated eight times after the initial statement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this then suggests that it was sung that way, and that there yeah. would be repetition in, in the music, and that there yeah. would be some variant in the chanting, subtle subtle variations on yeah, the theme. Yeah. yeah. So, it, 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 is that your impression that is consistent with the sung tradition? In my, it should be. It should be, because Vedas were. Uh, uh, chanted and recited in, a, in some kind of a melody. In fact, you will be surprised there were, there were ten different types of Vedic recitation. It's called Prakriti and Vikriti. Ten different types of Vedic recitations. Only four or five of them are surviving. The rest must have more or less vanished. So, it, it, they were designed to make it impossible for you to forget the Veda mantras. So uh, that's the idea behind. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, thank you, Namaskar. So thank you for uh, a wonderful questions. Namaskar. Om Shanti 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 Hi. Hari hi Om Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu